Yes. Okay, so today we're gonna have two great talks on lake management and management of lakes has improved over time with scientific and technological advancements in the field of limnology, but lakes continue to face multiple pressures um, that make lake management a, a challenge. So today lakes are subject to extreme changes in the environment such as droughts and wildfire that impact the, the supply and quality of water for wildlife, drinking water and recreational use. Management requires a delicate balance to meet regulatory, environmental, municipal, agricultural, and recreational needs that can often conflict with one another. And every lake or freshwater body is also unique, so there's really no one-size-fits-all recipe for management. And this can require detailed and complicated decisions tailored to the specific ecosystem, environmental stressors, or surrounding needs. And for today's presentation, uh, we're gonna focus on two key issues that lake managers face, cyanobacteria blooms and contaminants in fish. And both can have severe impacts to public health, ecosystem function and recreation. The State Water Resources Control Board is addressing these issues proactively and to speak more about their programs, we are excited to host our two speakers today. Marissa Van Dyke of the State Water Resources Control Board and Jay Davis of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing so Marissa can get ready um, while I introduce her. So our first presenter, Marissa, is a microbiologist at the State Water Resources Control Board in Sacramento. Her role includes management of the Freshwater Harmful Algal Bloom Program with, along with Car Carly Nielsen. And she has supported the development of the statewide FHAB program since 2014. And the program is implemented in close coordination with the regional water quality control boards located in nine regions. She also earned a master's of science in environmental management from the University of San Francisco. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Marissa. Hi. Hey everyone, this is Marissa Van Dyke and thank you Elizabeth for the introduction and thank you everyone for attending this session. So I'm gonna make sure my audio is working well before I get started. Yep, all good. All right, and let me set a timer to gauge where I'm at. All right. All right, so I'm from what we call the FHAB program at the water boards, and this says the Freshwater and Estuarine Harmful Algal Bloom Program. I'm going to be saying FHAB a lot, so I wanted to make sure I get ahead of that. And um, we're going to be going over some um, existing tools for monitoring and responding to um, HABs um, and particularly impacted waterways and uh, several improvements to tools that are just around the corner. Here's an outline of the materials I'm going to go over. Uh, first, quick little snapshot of you know what uh, cyanobacteria HABs are, and uh, what the FHAB program's history is, and what we're working towards now. Um, particularly an update since uh, approximately maybe two years ago when I addressed um, also this group, and uh, got lots of great feedback. So uh, really encouraging that to continue. I'm going to be providing a brief overview of the tools because there's quite a few and I uh, don't want to take up too much of your guys' time because you can take a deep dive anytime into that. And if anything sounds interesting, please contact the FHAB program or myself. I'm going to be sharing uh, some contact emails shortly and so that we can start dialogue. We host several workshops and meetings in the winter and spring months to educate organizations on these materials to help develop monitoring plans, particularly you know, using some screening tools that are lower cost to fit with what your monitoring questions are and so on. Also based on um, feedback from uh, stakeholders and water managers, we're working to develop a statewide monitoring program uh, for HABs and then improve several to tools that we've um, have and what we're going to be um, developing. So with that, um, there are several opportunities to collaborate with us to ensure the tools are useful to you. In particular, it's, we're going to be uh, launching a pilot scale effort of our partner led monitoring program that's been um, articulated in a strategic document that I'll introduce in a moment. And also we'll be developing um, a 
satellite imagery uh, data accessibility tool, particularly a API. Um, this is an application programming uh, interface. So it's um, not sure if everyone's here heard of an API. Um, this is software that allows two apps to talk to each other. For example, um, you can connect to the satellite tools backend uh, with your own system and be able to access our data sets and download them and so forth. We also have um, some expansion of some holiday assessments. We're also continuing to distribute free durable signs and we're working with a nonprofit to um, expand the capabilities of the Water Reporter web app, an online tool. All right, so get into freshwater habs. So cyanobacteria are the primary organisms that form harmful algal blooms in California, and they're the focus of our FHAB program. Cyanobacteria make dozens of different types of molecules that are toxic to humans, pets, livestock, and other animals. Humans and dogs are exposed to cyanobacteria on the, for the most part uh, through three different routes. Uh, skin contact can occur with um, getting in contact with water that contains cyanobacteria cells. The other exposure routes also ingestion and inhalation of cyanobacteria cells and aerosols. And when, when you're exposed, there's several different kinds of um, symptoms which are uh, shown here in this infographic. Ingestion is the most common form of acute poisoning that we observe, and dogs and children are most at risk because of the way that they uh, interact with waterways, um, particularly in recreation. Um, and because um, they're also more likely to unintentionally or intentionally drink bloom or also eat cyanobacteria mats or uh, also what some folks call toxic algal mats. All right, so the swamp, um, sorry, the FAB program is under the swamp effort, uh, which is uh, a surface water ambient monitoring program that uh, collects data to understand the condition of surf surface waters in California across the state. and. The Water Boards was designated lead agency back in 2016 to address the increasing occurrence of blooms. And um, with that, um, the initial efforts was to focus on responding to reports of blooms from the public and also um, reports, um, sorry, responding to those reports and assessing recreational exposures. Monitoring data from these recreational assessments was we found has been more and more commonly used by public water systems, systems in the division of drinking water for surveillance of these surface waters as well. Sorry, one second, I've got a little pop up that won't go away. All right, sorry, my. My Wi-Fi is having some troubles, so bear with me. All right, so let's get back to it. Um, as I was saying that um, monitoring data from recreational uses um, and monitoring is being more and more uh, commonly used um, to also uh, surveil surface waters. And most recently, there is approval of Assembly Bill 834, uh, the program um, uh, to establish a formal program for understanding freshwater and estuarine harmful algal blooms. And with that, we received full-time staff and funding, and those staff um, have been in place now since June of this year. And with this Assembly Bill, the program's purpose is significantly expanded with legislative mandates, as you can imagine. It's not only a priority to um, conduct incident response, but also um, to conduct monitoring and assessment at many different scales across the state, um, watershed scale, regional scale to track status and trends and help identify at-risk water bodies, and particularly also uh, conduct research and tool development so that we can work towards better management and mitigation of, um, of HABs uh, incurring in waterways. And since 2016, when we started beginning tracking blooms, we were finding that the reports are occurring in all months of the year in almost every county. We're also observing blooms in high elevation lakes and toxins are also being transported down to estuaries and impacting those other kind of uses there like fisheries and also freshwater and marine shellfish. Uh, reporting to the water boards has um, continued to increase and we have a little snapshot of the numbers there on the table here. 
And we're also tracking HAB-related illness reports involving impacts to humans, dogs, livestock, and wildlife. And when this occurs, we work with an interagency work group to investigate these reports, to collect the information, and to support better understanding to prevent um, HAB-associated illnesses. Um, and as many of you may have known, uh, particularly those that are participants of the CCHAB network, Earlier this year, a strategic framework for statewide uh, monitoring for HABs was completed, which lays out a long-term plan, approximately a 10-year plan, that we're beginning to implement this fall with the dedicated resources and building out um, the monitoring program's short-term priorities now and through the next three years. So there's lots of cool tools that are going to be getting developed through this effort. And um, with, with that, we're um, hoping that this will help us uh, address the increasing occurrences also of HABs. And we're finding that HABs are impacting many different waterways and beneficial uses. And, and the monitoring that we've done um, occasionally based off of incident, incident reports is inadequate. So a re really well-considered statewide monitoring strategy is necessary to meet the legislative mandates and work towards better water management and mitigation practices. And with that, we're going to be um, looking to st strengthening our remote sensing platform and developing tools to use this data and also other monitoring data so that we can um, um, better understand uh, the, the trends and occurrences of HABs across the state. So with that, we're going to be uh, pursuing higher resolution data that's going to be made available by federal agencies. I'm going to go into an introduction of some of the response and monitoring tools. And, and if any of these subjects look of interest to you, again, please contact us so that we can start a dialogue. Um, so since the majority of our resources to support the program are hosted on the portal, um, the California Habs portal, I'm going to be presenting what these tools are in kind of like three, or sorry, four different categories. The URL for the California Habs portal is provided here, and it's hosted by the My Water Quality Network. And generally, um, these tools can help you understand where Habs are occurring, um, how the public can stay safe, how to collect samples, and how to monitor and also um, how to utilize a recently developed response plan, um, which helps implement the, the older guidance from the CCAB networks on how to respond to blooms. So where are HABs? We've got two tools, uh, mapping tools, to, uh, to help answer that question. And uh, with that, we have a HAB reports map. It's quite popular uh, on the portal and anyone can submit a voluntary report using an online reporting form. And then uh, that's reviewed by staff before it's populates on a map. So there's some quality control there. And also um, many partner entities use this function to also share their monitoring uh, data at certain water bodies to um, show their proactive monitoring, to show where there's no advisories or where there might be advisory. And we also have a satellite mapping tool um, for many years now, and this was developed by, um, by SFEI and in coordination with our program, and it's for water managers and agencies um, to inform where cyanobacteria blooms are developing and help prioritize field assessments. The current tool displays um, pre-processed satellite imagery for approximately 250 of the largest water bodies. Some white channels can also be viewed with this imagery, uh, particularly in the delta. And the purpose, um, again, for this is to use as a screening tool based on the current uh, type of data that's presented here. And we don't use this to ad uh, issue advisories. It's more, again, as a screening tool to guide where to go in the field. And though uh, the cell imagery is expressed in like a heat map with cooler and warmer colors showing the increasing abundance of cyanobacteria, this doesn't show toxin concentrations from blooms. Uh, so in the near term, we're going to be uh, working towards improving capabilities of this platform by showing additional HAB indicators, again, developing an API or that interface to better download data and uh, adding additional satellite imagery from other satellites as well. And this is a quick um, oh, like snapshot of just the, uh, the interface of the web tool when you go in and look at an individual water body. And if you like to have training to better understand how, how to use this platform, we have a recorded webinar that we can provide to you. But generally, um, when you zoom into one lake, um, 
it presents um, this kind of interface where on the left side, there's a presentation of the lake with the satellite imagery. Uh, again, uh, the cyanobacteria abundance expressed in like kind of a heat map. And there's legend on the left that provides a little bit more information and, and clarifies that this is presenting an average of the satellite imagery over a 10 day period. So it's not from just the most recent flyover of the area, but also again, average with um, the 10 day data set. And then on the right hand side, there's a pretty cool function to see um, timeline or time series of data by using moving a bar, you can go back all the way to 2002 to see the different uh, cyanobacteria abundance that satellites have um, um, captured and has already been calculated for us to look at. And there's also some graphics on the um, lower portion to provide some statistics. So for the next kind of theme of materials. Um, these um, mostly cover, um, you know, informational inf uh, info for the public available uh, as um, web pages or also um, handouts that you can download as PDFs, including uh, frequently asked questions that we try to keep up um, every year, uh, keeping it up to date by, based off the questions that we get from, from the public and from stakeholders. And we also have a quick reference guide to distinguish cyanobacteria from common other like algae and duckweed and so forth, and information for pet owners, and then several different audiences like medical professionals, the fish and wildlife investigation folks, and also um, livestock uh, and farmers uh, to understand uh, impacts to livestock, particularly from uh, impacted stock ponds. The third general theme, uh, sorry, about um, of materials that are provided on the HABS portal is to inform how to collect samples, how to monitor to assess um, impacted waterways uh, to protect from recre for uh, sorry protect for recreational uses and also drinking water uses. And uh, before using the guidance for response to HABS, it's important to understand kind of some of the key terms that we use, particularly dis distinguish the guidelines for um, waterways that are experiencing planktonic blooms versus waterways that are experiencing benthic mats or benthic mats um, or blooms in their waterways. So on the left hand side, um, it, it kind of depicts a normal uh, kind of bloom that we most commonly see up in the open um, that accumulates up in the surface of the water. Um, more often, um, you know, accumulating as film or scum, and it's really easy to uh, visibly see that from the shoreline. And then on the right side, there's some photos that shows a river that initially looks clear, but when you get a closer look, you can see that some benthic mats are on the bottom surface, um, and that causes a little difficulty on monitoring to understand if there's any impacts and also for messaging. And the CC have guidance um, provides uh, different guidelines depending on each type of this bloom. And in particular, there's different triggers also for advisories based off of the different types um, of blooms that can occur. And um, we're mostly seeing these benthic blooms in uh, rivers and channels uh, in the north coast and some in the central coast and also in shallow areas of the lake. So something to keep an eye on. Um, as part of this um, effort, we also have a harmful algal bloom field guide that provides procedures to sample for each type of these blooms to inform uh, public health protection. This includes uh, safety for the field samplers and also educational materials to get you up to speed and pre-made forms and procedures uh, so that uh, data that's collected on the field is comparable you know, across different lakes and across different regions so that we can um, share information better. And the fourth and last uh, kind of category information is uh, you know, guidance for responding to blooms. And we've been able to um, most recently pull together all this information that's been available since 2016 into a user-friendly guide to better implement the guidelines uh, through a response plan. And on the portal, this response plan is summarized in a table format where you can view it and download it as well if you want to take it and um, use it offline. In that table, it has direct links to all the different resources found on the portal to help you navigate a little quicker. And I'm just going to provide a quick brief view, a brief overview of this material. So please familiarize this. Um, uh, I'm sorry, take time to uh, familiarize yourself with this and uh, perhaps integrate this into your organization's workflow so that it's um, something that a tool that you can use when necessary. 
And with the first step is um, to surveil water bodies using visual methods. And um, just to give you an idea of some of the resources that we have for each step, uh, this one includes a site reconnaissance procedure to help set up routine sites so that staff can go back um, and visually monitor trends, and also a visual guide to understand how these things look like, and also a further educational guide um, that shows lots of photos of different types of blooms. And then going on to the next two steps, um, when there's a suspect bloom, perhaps from your surveillance or from the public, then there's also um, this uh, opportunity then to report the bloom to an online reporting form. And also uh, that then triggers an interagency response where we support coordination with local agencies and water managers and help with that communication. And through that, um, with, through that with the FHAB program, we'll also help communicate with the division drinking water and other water purveyors, irrigation users downstream of these events to help um, uh, make locals aware of this potential issue. And then the next few steps, four um, through six, are the most like, you know, kind of bigger lifts. This includes field screening. So first, you know, if you got something suspect that looks a little different, um, you want to be able to distinguish if it's aquatic plants, uh, something just more nuisance algae, or perhaps cyanobacteria. There's lots of low-cost approaches to be able to distinguish that by um, some handheld tools, by microscopy, toxin testing kits as well out in the field. And then depending on what you're seeing, there could be the trigger then for sampling for lab analysis so that you have um, understand if there's any toxicity concerns and compare it to the guidance. So this is an overview of the voluntary California cyanobacteria guidance for recreational waters. This has been in place for about five years uh, from the CCHAB network and the FHAB program has been implementing it. And again, created this response plan to kind of pull everything together. It consists of flowcharts to walk you through the steps for either type of bloom that your water we may be experiencing and also thresholds for posting or deposting and pre-made signs. So you don't have to start from scratch. All right, and then with the following few steps, um, this goes over to how you know to conduct follow up monitoring to continue informing different advisories if necessary, and deposting criteria and also um, provides in uh, links to a web page that uh, collates a whole bunch of resources for drinking water purveyors, the new stuff that's always coming out. We also have a web page dedicated to updates on mitigation um, measures and also um, a communication toolkit with the media or the public. All right, so just checking on time. Let's get into the opportunities. This is the um, of these are tools and efforts that are of most interest um, to local organizations and water managers that we've been talking to many of you um, over the past year. And in particular, um, while uh, the FA program was working on developing the monitoring st strategy that was published earlier this year. And I just want to give a little brief overview of um, the framework that came from that effort that frames these opportunities really well. So we convened several technical advisory groups and stakeholder groups during the development. And the resulting framework comprehensively explores many options and recommendations for FHAB monitoring. This figure shows how multiple partners and approaches and supporting infrastructure can lead to the protection of beneficial uses from HABs. Um, remote sensing and uh, partner monitoring are at the core of these approaches for monitoring. And availability of high resolution data to expand our remote sensing capabilities and further tools to use this data um, is really um, critical to the success of monitoring program from our agency and also with our partners. There are several core principles that underpin the recommendations, of which I want to highlight that um, uh, one of the key goals is to make sure that all of the systems that we develop and data that comes from this is open and accessible to public and also other entities to support their decision making as well and not just kept internally. 
And with thousands of priority lakes and channels statewide, um, monitoring is much too big for one entity to perform. So we've been identifying leveraging opportunities and pursuing potential partnerships to maximize our investments into this effort. In particular, to be able to develop um, capture data across the state to better inform management actions and help prevent uh, reoccurring blooms. And so we're going to be focused on this in the next three years. And I'm highlighting a few opportunities that are actually starting this fall. Um, so great, great opportunities for you all to join with us to make sure these tools are useful to everyone. And in the end of this, this framework that was established, there were several recommendations. And the first one is to develop a um, a partner monitoring program. And uh, with this, um, this would be led by partners, but supported with some resources from the water boards as well. Um, it's going to be focused on uh, utilizing some pre-made cookbooks or modules, one of them's depicted here, that um, can be used depending on an entity's resources available and their monitoring questions. And these modules have already been developed. So we're, we're going to, again, put these together into cookbooks. So it's something that you can take and run with. And um, it focuses on assessing impacts um, like recre to recreation and to fishing. And um, we're going to be preparing a pilot in the near term. And we're in the final stages of developing a modern data infrastructure to support all of this, particularly with web apps. And so uh, we're looking forward to recruit partners um, during this pilot effort. Second priority from the framework, uh, and which is the, of most interest uh, to a lot of stakeholders, is focusing on strengthening remote sensing and, ex and expanding the state's existing platform of the satellite imagery. What you find is that remote sensing enables um, FHAB data collection at a scale and frequency that few, if any, um, field monitoring efforts can match. The framework highlights the complementary nature of remote sensing data to field data. And um, we also hope to be able to um, be able to present the field data alongside remote sensing in further updates of this tool. And so some of the ways that we're going to be uh, strengthening this remote sensing platform is first by making sure that the data that's already available is accessible to everyone that's interested. So we're going to uh, develop an API, again, an interface that allows um, easy downloads of data sets to other systems, and in particular, address the um, highly requested need of having um, data sets that show the daily average from each flyover across lakes um, with a little less statistical analysis than what the platform currently shows. And in also the near term, uh, hopefully by the spring, we're going to be expanding additional indicators that are presented or have indicators that are presented on this tool, particularly a chlorophyll A data set presented as another layer. This is already available from the Sentinel-3 satellite. And again, we're going to be working with NOAA and federal agencies to pursue additional data with higher resolution capabilities from the Sentinel-2, um, along with some other states across the country. Um, and to be able to do um, even more with, uh, with satellite imagery, we're going to be reviewing the quality of this data, data and putting that into a, a quality assurance plan um, so that it's you know, a solid reference for folks to um, to understand you know, what the quality is when interpreting it and work towards using this uh, cell imagery to some other useful tools that many other states are pursuing, like developing an early warning tool. This has been um, highly sought of after by many stakeholders and also use this inf information to verify blooms, you know, perhaps not need to send somebody out first out in the field and go, oh yeah, there is a bloom here. Um, and also, um, use solid imagery data to inform risk assessments like landscape, real, um, landscape scale of risk assessments across multiple watersheds. So you're understanding what the, where the potential risks are to focus monitoring and mitigation. And um, we'll be supporting also field-based verification to again, improve the understanding of the satellite imagery data um, that's provided by the federal agencies. And through this effort with the strategy, um, we highlighted that just taking a look at what priority lakes there are nearby um, paved roads, there's about over, sorry, there's actually over 15,000 different lakes that were highlighted by the stakeholders and the technical advisory committee. And that map is uh, depicted here on the right. So it's just really clear that we even need to expand uh, the capabilities of satellite imagery to cover more of the spatial scale of the state. 
in just an interest of time, I'm going to um, speed through some more of these opportunities. Um, many of you are probably aware from the past um, a little over a year, we've been making available free durable signs. Uh, these are already pre-printed signs um, that are uh, available to also download on the portal. We're going to uh, add additional funding to this effort to make uh, general awareness signs available as well. And the newer toxic algal mats, they've been in high demand um, this past summer. And these will be available on a couple different materials, not metal, because those don't work out too well. So it's going to be available on um, corrugated cardboard and hard PVC plastic. And we have a little uh, survey form to fill out if the folks that are interested in obtaining these signs uh, just to have on hand. And uh, another effort that we'll be um, continuing to expand and work on is to um, better improve state-led field surveys focused on human health. This was again identified in the strategy. And uh, state-led FM monitoring will take several different forms. Um, and one of those is expanding the existing pre-holiday assessments that are already coordinated with the CCAB network. This year, because you know it's something simple that we can um, get to right away, was expanding these opportunities for these events. So we held um, three different events this summer for the major holiday weekends. And with focusing on assessing popular recreational waterways at least um, three times per the summer, you can get, again, three sets of monitoring data per year. And with this data set, along with other monitoring approaches, the remote sensing data, um, once it's strengthened, um, it'll help us work towards increasing the amount of monitoring data that's collected across the state to inform um, our better understanding and also develop um, much more interesting tools to help us address these issues. In this past summer, we dedicated about $150,000 to support the lab analysis of samples that were collected by um, from partner from partner entities that signed up. And we have the capacity to expand uh, more, so we encourage additional organizations to join. Also, if you don't need lab analysis uh, support, you can also share your data. We've been hearing feedback um, from some participants that's been a good way for local managers to showcase proactive recreational monitoring. Um, to be able to also showcase the data on a map and not need to, um, you know, manage that yourself and spend those costs internally for each organization so that there's a centralized mapping tool that anyone can use and uh, get their data on and um, then point also um, their public and other interested parties to. And lastly, another opportunity um, to collaborate with us is um, improving the Water Reporter app. This is uh, an app that's most popular on the East Coast and developed by a nonprofit called The Commons. And they've added a HAB monitoring module that they're beta testing with California now. There's many stakeholders and like community groups that have signed up to um, test it in the beta form. And this provides a, um, a, a way to, um, sorry, the, the app provides um, a way to collect data by um, using uh, your cell phone or the web app, and it provides uh, data storage on the cloud uh, with some some pretty um, large capabilities of data storage. It provides formats um, of data uh, structure that are pre-made um, to collect some common HAB indicators and HAB information already, and also helps you visualize your data with internal uh, maps that are embedded. Um, a later ability will be connecting um, the, the outputs that are made public or made shareable through this web app to the FHAB monitoring's data system so that we can um, make it easier to share information, to populate the centralized web map and communicate you know, what monitoring is happening across the state, um, show where there's no advisories or where there's may maybe some kind of impacts from HABs and better share all that information. So I'm going to stop here and allow you time to document um, this contact information. This is for the general impacts to the FAB program. And also, we're going to be announcing um, when there's opportunities to collaborate on these tools, provide review and feedback, that kind of thing, through the CCHAB Network's listserv. Um, so um, please take a moment to um, uh, look at this URL and sign up if you haven't already. I know we're all signed up through a lot of listservs, but it's a, uh, one of the ways that we um, we announce when we have these opportunities um, to put together some work groups or um, share materials that um, are out for review. 
And uh, I'm going to turn this back to our host. Um, if there's opportunity for questions, but I believe that's waiting until the end of this panel. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time um, to listen to this presentation. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa, for your great presentation. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that our question and answer session will be after our next presenter. And if you have questions, to submit them to the chat box. Um, we're now going to play a short video from one of our conference sponsors, um, and then we'll move on to our next speaker. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, can you see my screen with the Water Quality Solutions ad? We're just seeing your desktop right now. Okay. For some reason that didn't work. Ding, ding, ding. How about now? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I was just gonna play this quick video from Water Quality Solutions. Uh, they're a conference sponsor for Calm 2021 and they made a really generous contribution into our student scholarship fund. And so please pay attention to this couple minute video. At Water Quality Solutions, we partner with clients to analyze flow and improve water quality in lakes and reservoirs. We develop detailed models and perform data analysis for indirect potable reuse, hypolimnetic oxygenation, aeration, HAB mitigation, and other applications. We also employ statistical analysis, advanced visualizations, and animations to refine and communicate our findings. Our recent work includes a diverse array of projects with municipal and academic clients. We provided water quality analysis and design of a hypolimnetic oxygenation system in Lake Casitas in Ventura County, which was installed in 2015. We have assisted with developing a detailed water quality monitoring plan and analyzing data. Our follow-up analysis has shown that water quality has improved markedly as a result of hypolimnetic oxygenation. Following the Thomas fire in the Lake Casitas watershed, we also investigated the wildfire effects on water quality and made recommendations to mitigate future impacts. For Sweetwater Reservoir in Southern California, we evaluated several potential water quality improvement strategies to mitigate HABs and high manganese levels. We identified destratification as the preferred option and employed 1D modeling to size and optimize the system. We have also partnered with the city of San Diego to, to assess the water quality effects of a potable reuse project for Miramar, Otay, and San Vicente Reservoir. We developed a three-dimensional water quality and hydrodynamic model, which was validated through a tracer study. This hydrodynamic model is being used to demonstrate compliance with DDW dilution regulations. In collaboration with the University of Vermont, we developed a three-dimensional water quality model of the inland sea of Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain is a 500 square mile lake in the northeastern United States and Canada. This model leverages data for many projects to capture the spatial and temporal extent of harmful algal blooms. This model will be used to simulate the long-term effects of changing climate and land use on HABs that currently affect recreation areas and municipal water supplies. With our experience in water quality and modeling, don't hesitate to contact us for help finding solutions to your lake and reservoir questions. All right. So now we're going to move on to our second speaker, and our, his name is Dr. Jade Davis. Dr. Davis grew up near the PCB-contaminated aquatic food web of Lake Michigan. Dr. Davis is lead scientist of the Regional Monitoring Program for Water Quality in San Francisco Bay. He is also lead scientist for the bioaccumulation element of the California State Water Resource Control Board's Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program. His primary research interests are monitoring the accumulation of persistent contaminants in, the, in aquatic food webs of the Bay, its watershed, and aquatic ecosystems in California. So welcome, Dr. J. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I was asking if you could hear me. <laughs> 
Thank you for using my preferred name, Dr. J. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark for the invitation to speak at your symposium today. Um, Mark asked whether I could come up with a catchy title for my talk. And uh, I opted for more, more of a descriptive title, but Mark pointed out that any title with fish in it is catchy, catchy. So thanks Mark for the assist on that too. Um, it's great to be here to talk to you about the um, statewide monitoring that we're doing um, of contaminants in fish. Um, it's a, um, similar to the FHAB program, it's a, it's a resource that managers should be aware of, um, especially um, if you're interested in mercury. And as you'll see from the slides I present about you know, most of the lakes in California have mercury issues. And so uh, it's uh, um, relevant to, to, to lake managers very, very broadly. So this is another uh, element of the surface water ambient monitoring program that Marissa um, introduced. And it's a state water board program. The mission is to produce timely high quality information to evaluate the condition of all waters throughout California. Um, so the bioaccumulation monitoring program is one of the programs, the, the FHAB program is another. Um, the other two are the bioassessment program and the stream pollution trends program. And then there's also monitoring that's done under SWAMP in each of the nine regions that the state is divided up into um, with the nine regional water boards. Um, and they, they do uh, a variety of things uh, in their own regions um, tailored to, to their needs. So um, I'm gonna focus on the bioaccumulation monitoring program and particularly on um, lake and reservoir monitoring. I'm just gonna use the term lakes in general, but I'm referring to both. Um, this program is about informing management and so that uh, um, water, water quality can be improved in the long run in California. Um, and some of the main ways that we're informing management are 303D listings. Um, there's a map here showing um, listed water bodies. Uh, as of uh, 2018, there were 131 reservoirs listed as mercury impaired. Um, the vast majority of those were uh, the listings were based on data generated by the, the bioaccumulation monitoring program. Um, we're also supporting TMDLs and other control programs. Um, the state control program for reservoirs is something that um, the lake monitoring that we're doing is, is intended to support. Um, and then we also provide data that feeds into OEHA advisories and uh, there have been over a hundred advisories um, that have been newly established or updated um, using data from the bioaccumulation monitoring program. So we have a, a work group that provides oversight for the, the monitoring done by the bioaccumulation monitoring program. It's the safe to eat work group and the, this work group actually has a dual role. It's a subcommittee of the SWAMP Roundtable, and in that capacity provides oversight on the monitoring that we're doing. And then it's also a, a, a work group of the California Water Quality Monitoring Council, um, which has a, a role in coordinating water quality monitoring throughout the state. And so for, um, for you know, in, in that role, we have, meetings that are open to the public. And another one of our, our goals is to, to coordinate the monitoring that's being done on bioaccumulation of contaminants by fish and shellfish. Um, the members on the work group include staff from the state and regional boards, um, US EPA. We also have a peer review panel of some of the, um, some world experts on bioaccumulation. Um, and uh, we have peer review built into the program. The, the, this panel reviews our designs, um, reviews, re, helps us review the results that come in and the reports that we write. Um, so uh, we've gotten 
lots of good advice um, from our advisors over the course of the program. It's helped us help helped us target our monitoring in the in the best way possible and made it as cost effective as it can be. And um, as I mentioned, the meetings are open to all. And at the end of my slides, I've got a, a slide that shows uh, all the links to to access this work group and other resources. So um, I'll leave that up at the end. So the Swamp Bioaccumulation Monitoring Program began in 2007. Um, I've been leading it ever since it began. And um, it's, it's charged with covering all the different water body types throughout California. So we've, you know, we've, we've divided the, the water bodies into, into three main categories, lakes, um, the coast, which includes uh, the outer coast and bays and estuaries, and then rivers and streams. And to start things off, we, um, we started off with quite a bang uh, at the beginning with um, a lake survey uh, that uh, I'll provide more information on, uh, relatively intensive monitoring in the first two years. Um, then we did a two-year survey of the coast, um, and then a one-year survey of rivers and streams. And so in those first five years, we covered all the major water body types with statewide surveys. And then going down through the years, um, I, the main thing I wanna show here is that we've done a lot of work in lakes. Um, in 20, 2012 and 13, we did a study that was focused on wildlife and um, looked at mercury accumulation by grebes and also in, prey, in their prey, the prey fish that they eat. In 2014, we did, a, did a, a study that was focusing on lakes with low concentrations and trying to understand uh, what makes them low. And then in 2015, we started a long-term uh, effort that is focused on bass lakes. And that uh, is something that we do now. Ever since 2015, we do it every other year. And the plan is to continue doing this as a long-term monitoring program. In 2016, we did more lakes, um, lakes that hadn't been sampled yet um, and, and uh, addressing information gaps that had been identified by the regional boards. And then um, going forward, we're, we're um, revisiting the, our monitoring on the coast on roughly a 10 year cycle. Um, again, every odd year, we've got this bass lake, long-term bass lake monitoring planned. Um, the bottom part of this slide shows things in italics that are, are tentatively planned in our long-term plan. Um, and then in 2022, there's a, you know, we're starting some, some new monitoring that's called realignment. And I'll explain what that is um, in my next slide. Um, so lakes have been a huge part of, of what, what we're monitoring in this program. So the realignment. Um, so um, in the last couple of years, um, we've, uh, discuss some, some gaps in the program that, that we've established um, and uh, the need to better collaborate and connect with other water board divisions, regions, and programs. And then also um, one of the main gaps is that um, there's increasing concern recently with, um, the, with the exposure to contaminants by groups with high consumption rates, subsistence fishers, and tribes, um, and um, the the monitoring that we've established is not particularly targeting those potential high exposure groups. So this was identified as an important gap, and and we're um, undergoing this realignment process to address that. And basically, what it means is that um, we're going to be on a region by region basis. Um, engaging with communities that have these uh, high consumption rates, finding out where they fish, what, what fish they like to catch and eat, and then um, sampling to, to fill those data gaps. We're starting this in the San Diego region. We're doing the community engagement work right now and then developing a plan that we'll start implementing next year. And then this is planned to be something that we do every year. We're going to, going to go um, through each of the regions uh, with this community engagement um, driven 
um, uh, monitoring. So I want to talk, um, go back to the sort of the beginning of the bioaccumulation monitoring and this uh, initial um, intensive effort in 2007 and eight, where we sampled 272 lakes in, in two years. Um, currently we're sampling about 35 lakes a year. So this was uh, about five times more intensive in terms of um, what we took on, uh, but established a really strong data set. Um, we sampled um, 222 lakes that were uh, identified as popular for fishing in the regions and then 50 as a random sample. Um, the results came out that the distributions we got were very similar between these targeted and the random lakes. Um, and then in these initial surveys, we, we did uh, included mercury analysis as well as organics in all of, all of the water bodies. Um, so this is, was really the beginning of establishing a, a really rich data set on uh, bioaccumulation in California lakes. Um, the, the key contaminant, the contaminant of greatest and most widespread concern is mercury. Um, this graph is from those first two years of data and we've, we've added a lot to it since then, but the basic patterns have held up. Um, this graph shows, uh, the dots show the species, basically the highest average concentration for a species at each lake. And so kind of the, the severity of the problem um, and, um, you know, we, this, this data set show that we, we, you know, we, we knew that there's a problem in Northern California, but we, we filled in our understanding of that, um, with all with these red dots, which indicate concentrations above 0.44 parts per million, which is the no consumption range for the sensitive population, uh, which are, um, women of childbearing age and children. So there's a lot of red symbols in Northern California, um, but we also saw a lot of lakes with the you know, concentrations in this high category in Southern California and really across all different uh, sort of uh, parts of the landscape throughout the state. Um, so it's not just a Northern California problem. Uh, we found low concentrations in many high elevation lakes, uh, but these were generally lakes that don't have um, largemouth bass. These are generally trout lakes, and a lot of them are uh, uh, planted trout that uh, aren't really reflecting the local food webs uh, and have low concentrations, which is a good thing. So the distribution of species is another um, major factor uh, on a statewide basis. Um, and as I showed earlier, the, these data were uh, the main basis for the, the 303D listings um, of lakes across the state. So something that we've learned um, is that uh, black bass are really, really good indicators of mercury. Um, they're obviously a sport fish, so there's a tie to human exposure. They accumulate high concentrations due to their position at the top of the food chain in, in these in lakes. Um, they're widely distributed. They, they integrate over time and space, but they do still respond on uh, a, a sort, of, sort of one or two or three year time scale. So they are responsive um, to changes. Um, they generate highly re reproducible data. And I'll show uh, some examples of that. Um, and, but it's important to understand how they accumulate and they, um, they accumulate higher concentrations in larger, older fish. And so it's really important to take that into account and adjust your data for that. Um, so it's best to collect fish spanning a wide size range so that you can adjust for the, for the size of the fish. Um, so largemouth bass are sort of a great litmus test for mercury contamination of uh, food webs in, in lakes. So this is an example data set um, from just from 2016. I grabbed this uh, data set because it was handy um, and shows what we typically get when we uh, do one of our uh, rounds of sampling uh, for, the, for the black bass. Um, and there's a 
the, the, the graph is showing length on the x-axis and mercury concentration on the y. And there's sort of this general pattern of uh, increasing concentrations uh, at greater length. It, the slope of the line uh, really varies from lake to lake. Um, and that's, you know, the, the lakes that have low levels are have a low slope. And then some lakes like Coyote Lake, these X's um, have higher levels. Um, so taking a closer look at Coyote Lake, um, the, the approach we use um, just is just bas basically based on doing a regression of mercury versus length. And then um, using that regression equation to estimate a concentration at a length that's in the middle of the distribution that we usually get, so 350 millimeters. So we can standardize um, the concentrations and compare apples to apples. Um, the, the slope of this line is often steep so that um, if you didn't take length into account um, and you got uh, a bunch of fish, so you go out and you, you catch a bunch of fish that's skewed towards the, the lower end of the side, the st typical size range, so 300 millimeters. Um, in this lake, you'd be at about 0.5 parts per, per million. Um, but if you got fish that's at the upper end of the, the usual range at around 400 millimeters, then your value would be in the 0.8 range. So that's a, a big difference between 0.5 and 0.8. Um, so in order to take that potential confounding factor um, into account, we have this approach, catch across a, a large, wide, uh, a wide size range and estimate the concentration at 350 millimeters. So when you do this, um, we've seen that there's um, very high consistency in the data that are generated. And again, I'm showing Coyote Lake from 2016 um, and comparing to the initial survey in 2008 and these means are very consistent. These graphs show the mean plus or minus two standard errors. Um, so if the, the error bars don't overlap, then that would be a significant difference. Um, these values you know, were very similar and the, error, the confidence intervals um, overlap, so no difference. Um, another lake from 2016 with a, with a low concentration had, we've, we've sampled it three times. And similarly, you know, for you know, it's, uh, lower levels, but similar results were um, pretty, I think, remarkable consistency over time. Um, so we're getting an increasing data set on these revisits. And um, as we get more data, the, the most common result that we're seeing is no change. Um, so um, this is telling us a couple different things. One is that this indicator is robust and um, you know, it produces data that, that um, are, are consistent and comparable over time. And then also it's telling us that in many of these lakes, the methylmercury cycling and levels of methylmercury in the food web are also very consistent over time. So the things that make Dixon Lake have low mercury levels are, are consistent and as are the things that make Coyote Lake have high mercury. So I wanna talk about the Bass Lake sampling, this long-term sampling that began in 2015. And uh, we uh, started this because there's, you know, these, these uh, lakes uh, with, with bass um, have, um, generally high degree of impairment, high mercury concentrations, and we're a big driver of the listings and the TMD, uh, the statewide TMDL effort. Um, and because the bass are a robust indicator present in these lakes. And um, so we identified a pool of these, the, the sort of top priority bass lakes, about 190 of them. And um, there's a need for periodically updating the information on the status of these lakes. Then also there's a need for tracking trends um, at the statewide level. And up until this, this program, there wasn't really any data set that could be used to track uh, whether, to track the status of mercury on a statewide scale. 
and whether things at a statewide level are getting better or worse. So um, this design has us revisiting these lakes on a 10 year cycle. Each lake gets revisited on a 10 year cycle. We, again, we picked about a, the 190 lakes of highest interest. This was based on budget, what we, what we could afford on an annual basis. We primarily focus now on mercury, but do some sampling of PCBs and legacy pesticides. And then um, through, through the way we designed this, by splitting up these 190 lakes into five different random groups, each time we go out, we get a representative average for that group of 190 lakes. Um, so um, I basically said this, so I'll pass, skip past that. Um, this map shows the 190 lakes, and then uh, the different colors indicate different panels. And I'm showing each panel individually here, so you can see that they're spread throughout the, the, the state and the water board regions. Um, and then each time we, we sample, we get a good average, a, a good estimate of average condition. A few more details. Um, we collect sport fish and prey fish. Uh, there's um, a prey fish mercury objective and the prey fish are a good uh, sort of backup indicator of mercury in lakes. Um, we collect via, via in, in electroshocker boat from April through October. The number of stations varies with lake size. So if they're small lakes, we do one station. Uh, ranging to very large lakes, we do four stations and we collect other data uh, that are needed to interpret the contaminant data. So we've generated a, um, a really great data set on, on this, you know, using this, this uh, mercury litmus test, the black bass, the length adjusted black bass. And uh, this graph, I don't expect you to read, but it shows the 194 lakes that we've sampled and, and, and uh, were able to estimate a length adjusted mean. And um, so it's an apples to apples comparison from Almaden Lake to Lake Zayak. Um, and in, by 2017, it, which is what this graph is from the 2017 report, we'd sampled 194 lakes we're, we're getting the 2019 data soon and we'll be uh, issuing a report on that and including those in here. Um, but there's a wide range. Uh, there are some lakes in California with low mercury concentrations, um, but 65% of lakes in the state are higher than the 0 0.2 part per million um, statewide objective um, in the other, um, other uh, descriptive stats are shown here. And then um, as part of this, as I mentioned, we're also, each time we go out, we get an estimate of the statewide mean. So we're beginning a time series that can be used to track long-term trends. The 2019 data point is coming soon. Um, I'm uh, um, very interested to see how that turns out. Um, in 2017, we, um, we saw concentrations that were higher than 2015, not statistically significant, but um, still, as I think, a surprisingly a surprising increase from uh, 2015 and 17. Um, we had, you know, 2017 was the end of a five-year drought, so hydrology could be a factor. But um, as we get more data points throughout the years, we can start to sort out the drivers. Um, of any variation that we see, and then ultimately be able to track whether things are um, getting getting better, worse, or just staying the same. And then I mentioned these revisits. Uh, we've done about 50 of them as of 2017, and usually we see no change, uh, just based on comparing data within each lake. Um, in 2017, there were, uh, most of these increased um, observations of increases were in 2017, where that overall mean was higher. So uh, a key take home is that um, 
this program, like the, the FHAB program is a resource. This is a little different where we're doing a lot of more centralized monitoring, but um, we're, all, we're, we're also a potential partner in studies. We like supporting you know, one of our uh, um, reasons for existence is to support management. So uh, we like doing that when we can. We've developed methods and our uh, and our resource in terms of expertise in doing this type of monitoring, and we've got a really um, I think rich data set that uh, any any data from any lake can be compared to. So um, we're a little short on time, so I'm just going to show the acknowledgments from uh, other key contributors, and then here's that slide showing how to get more information on the various um, various groups and processes that I mentioned. And I will end it with that. Thank you, Jay. Um, so now we're gonna start the Q&A session. And while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, I'm gonna share a slide here. All right, so uh, so we just wanted to point out that uh, we do have a comms uh, online store um, with a lot of cool merchandise that anyone can purchase. Um, so we have a lot of shirts and hats and it looks like even some shirts specific to this year's uh, conference. So be sure to check that out. If you have time, the link is on the screen here. So we can get started with our question and answer session. Let's see. So it looks like the first question is for Marissa and it is what research has the harmful algal bloom program funded and what findings have come from it focused on HAB control slash treatment? These would fall under what the strategy calls management actions. Hey, Stephen, thanks for that question. Um, uh, happy to hear that you're interested in more management actions and you know getting researched to inform that um so much of the research that uh, the hab program has been able to fund um, in the past few years again was you know during well we had like an informal program with borrowed funds actually borrowed from bog or um now renamed bmp um so there was limited very limited funding to help support research and most of that funding went to um supporting uh, the expansion or of remote sensing with federal agencies working with SFEI to develop that the satellite um, tool and also conducting field-based um, satellite verification studies as well, um, that kind of thing. So with uh, now that this year we've got a full-time staff and th this year is the first year that we got the um, the the permanent funding for the program, we can look forward to funding a much more research and work towards and you know research that will support management actions and um, understanding better um, like you know developing data to have case studies on what controls and treatments are working well. Um, in in the near term, the next three years of implementing the um, the strategy um, for monitoring, we're going to be focused on you know. Um, doing the data infrastructure development, which is mostly internally funded and with nonprofits, um, but also expanding out to develop the different approaches to monitoring. Um, again, with remote sensing, partner-led monitoring, and state-led monitoring by leveraging a lot of the programs that are already going out into lakes and streams collecting data, like the BMP program. And then after that, once we've got some um, a good set of monitoring data, particularly with the the focus studies of understanding um, also the environmental drivers supporting HAM, so we can use that data set to understand better um, management actions to do case studies on controls and treatments. But uh, from our technical advisory committee, they highlighted, you know, the and also from stakeholders, really the sore need of having monitoring data to understand the drivers at an individual water body is not just at the watershed scale, because uh, there's you know different drivers happening at each water body. It's, it's site specific, as researchers always say to us. Um, and so we need that monitoring data, that foundation to inform those next steps of that strategy, so we can we can get to addressing those management questions. Um, 
one study we were able to partially fund, which was um, kind of ties into this, is um, out on the region, regional board six or the Lahontan region, there's a community that installed um, some controls in uh, lagoons. And so we were able to um, fund the post um, uh, the kind of treatment monitoring um, so that a case study can, um, you know, can be published from that to understand if um, these um, controls uh, helped reduce the occurrence of blooms occurring in their lakes or sorry, lagoons. So um, that's something that will be forthcoming, but. Um, but it's uh, not finished yet to, to publish. But please let us know if there's any other opportunities for us to help fund that, that monitoring, particularly that post-monitoring um, to understand if, if treatment's working. That's sometimes um, where you know, funding is scarce um, to do the, the after the treatment monitoring because you know, so much went into justifying the need to get funding to install treatments or do tre um, controls and not necessarily following up to see how it works. Okay, great. So our second question is for Jay, and it's asking, Assembly Bill 762 mandates that reservoir owners post site-specific mercury advisories where they exist. Oftentimes, these advisories are based on old data that don't adequately represent the different sources of variability in fish HG concentrations. As a result, risk could be miscommunicated to anglers. How can or should advisories be updated to reflect new information? Well, um, it's you know obviously really important to have updated data, and um, the the swamp monitoring we're trying to to do that as much as possible. Um, we work, you know, we've got our list of bass lakes, and then we also try to fit in um, other lakes when we're out doing our lake surveys um, that that are identified as priorities by each of the regional boards. So we try to fit in a few more where we can. Um, and uh, OEHA lets us know, you know what the data gaps are for each of the water bodies. And we try to fill those you know, for the lakes that, that we are doing. Um, and you know, we'll be doing some more high priority water bodies that are identified through that realignment uh, community engagement effort. Um, but you know the basic answer is it's it's really important to get to get um, current data to accurately um, you know characterize condition and, and give good advice. All right, um, not sure who this question is for from Mark. Someone remind me of the rule of thumb: if two times standard error bars don't overlap, equals that difference, statistical difference, or was standard deviation being used? Yeah, that was one that I was uh, based on right. my slides. Um, so two times the standard error is, is you know, approximately the 95% confidence interval of the mean. Um, so that's the, the basic rule of thumb that um, I was talking about. We're using standard error uh, in not standard deviation, because I'm showing means and we're comparing means. Okay. And another question for Jay, are there examples of treatment lakes perhaps receiving mm -hmm. oxygen input where you've seen mercury actually decrease in fish? Um, yeah, the uh, sort of treatment and uh, you know, manipulation of lakes with oxygen and other other approaches is not not something I'm tracking um, very closely. I think Mark and actually the Mark Butel who asked the previous question, I'm sure are way more up to date on that than I am. Um, so I, I'm not I'm not aware of any examples of that, but I'm not really tracking that um, that work or literature very closely. Yeah, we have some, uh, Valley Water has done some studies on that um, where Mark Silos was looking at that and found some declining trends in fish tissue over time. Yeah, um, I guess I'd just say, Joe, the short answer would be that we've seen some declining trends since oxygenation in small fish. So 100 millimeter length standardized fish like Jay was saying earlier, but whether that uh, actually translates to lower concentrations in fish that people eat, maybe not. 
complicated as it often is for Mercury. <laughs> okay. And the next one is over the past 13 or so years, have we seen any statewide trends such as during droughts or general warming? I'm not sure who this one is for. I think uh, well, Jay presented uh, a little information about, um, I, th I think it was the 2017 data set that showed some data after the drought. Maybe that's where that was coming from. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, so that's, you know, we're starting to, we've just initiated a monitoring that's going to generate a time series that's going to give us some information on, on statewide trend. Um, but we don't, you know, we don't really have, uh, yeah, we don't really have great time series or, or data to, to address that question. Um, there is one other data set that's uh, pretty, a pretty strong one that's being developed for the Delta. Um, the Delta RMP has uh, initiated um, annual monitoring of mercury in 2016. And um, it, it's been very eye-opening um, because it, it started at, it, it, towards the, the end of the, the five-year drought. And then again, 2017 was a high flow year. And we saw at a couple of stations in the Delta, again, using largemouth bass as the indicator, we do that in the Delta as well. Um, we saw really huge increases at a couple stations that seemed to be related to the high flows. Um, so there's, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, with the monitoring that's begun in the last few years, um, we're starting to get some, some indications of the importance of hydrology. Um, but you know, we still we need to get more data to be more confident that it's driven by hydrology. But the, there are early indications of that. And uh, aside from that, um, I can't think of other data sets that um, uh, address sort of long-term trends in response to drought or or warming. Okay, and then another question for Jay: Hal is asking if mercury samples are collected from fillets. If so, do fillets grow uniformly? And is that considered when sampling for mercury? Could different fillet sample sites create bias? Um, they are, we do collect fillets and that's um, consistent with um, the way OEHA, the, the state agency that issues fish advisories recommends that, that uh, fishers consume fillets. So we, we focus on fillets. Uh, and you know, generate fillet data for them to uh, generate their advisories. Um, to to my knowledge, the fillets do are you know do grow sort of uniformly and are. You know, I haven't seen anything that suggests that um, non-uniform growth of fillets is something that you need to to take into account when you're when you're doing this type of monitoring. Um, we think we think the fillets are a good representation of what's in the fish, and uh, and that you know the fish the, these these uh, indicator species are good indicators of what's going on in the food web in general. All right, and another mercury question: Is there a parallel study of the source of the mercury in each lake? Um, short answer is no. I wish there was. Um, we uh, um, we we've got a with we've, we're we're uh, getting the most out of a, a limited budget and uh, you know just getting the the, the constant the fish tissue data from as many lakes as we can. Um, we did uh, I mentioned the study that where we looked at clean lakes and we're we're um, you know wanting to investigate if we could find anything unusual about these clean lakes and what make what makes them have low mercury concentrations. And we didn't really reach a, a, a clear conclusion on that. And you know, we didn't really have the funding to, to do the thorough studies that would be needed to, to look at the sources, you know, like to, to really 
get good information on sources to each lake and um, the cycling of, of mercury in each lake. Um, so it would be a, you know, to really look at the sources for, for each lake would be a huge job. Um, so, you know, I think there's, that's, that's the main reason that it doesn't exist. Um, but, you know, it, it would be nice if we had that and we could really understand um, what's driving uh, mercury, high mercury in the food web. But I think in, in general, um, there are sources from the landscape, um, from, uh, you know, runoff from the land, from, from uh, geologic deposits and mining in the watershed. Um, and then there's also inputs from the atmosphere. Um, so if you look across the whole landscape, there are places where there isn't any mining or geologic mercury in the watershed and not much development, but mercury can still be, you know, at levels of concern in places like that. So um, atmospheric input of mercury is enough if the conditions in the lake are right to um, lead to problematic levels of mercury in the food web. Um, so that atmospheric input's a tough, you know, tough one to control. The it's, mercury's globally distributed and a lot of the mercury that deposits in California comes from Asia. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a, a tough one, but there are, I'm, you know, there are, you know, I'm pretty confident that there are places and, you know, across the state as well, where there are inputs from the watersheds that are important. And it would be nice to understand that better. Okay, great. And um, I see one last question here from Marissa. It says, I know toxin release can seem random, even when potentially toxic cyanobacteria are present. How often should a potential bloom be monitored for toxins to make sure you don't miss the release? What is known about the reason some blooms release toxins and others don't seem to? A good question, folks. Um, if you want to talk about this more, feel free to reach out to me. So um, that's right, you know, toxin release or, or even toxin production in cyanobacteria communities and in, in, also in, in individual genera and species does seem random, right? There's a lot of research going towards understanding why um, cyanobacteria, certain species start producing the toxins and then, you know, which genera or toxin groups are readily released um, and more in the dissolved um, water fraction versus in the cells. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of literature to review to better understand this, but there's not like a clear answer yet. Um, some of the, um, some of the research shows that perhaps environmental stress um, causes a uh, a community of cyanobacteria to start producing toxins when they weren't previously. Um, and also as a bloom occurs and forms, um, the community group of dominant cyanobacteria that are present in a bloom changes as well with over time. So like some often times with these, um, some lakes that do have routine monitoring with microscopy, um, particularly the Klamath watershed, uh, Klamath River watershed, Clear Lake, um, those two lakes have, or watersheds have really great monitoring programs. We'll get routine monitoring and with microscopy and they've seen like, you know, the cyanobacteria bloom that starts in the spring will be dominated by a certain genera and, and um, not have necessarily the toxin capabilities when looking at the genetic analysis of the community. And then it turns over and changes um, in the early summer and then late summer again. And really having routine monitoring, including microscopy helps inform what's going on into your community. So going to, to uh, how often should these things be monitored? Um, that's a good question. And um, if you're looking at EPA recommendations and also the CCHAB network guidance that came out in 2016, it recommends monitoring on a on every two weeks on um, highly recreational waterways, particularly at, at beaches that are accessed by the public. Um, and that's really frequent. And, you know, with uh, monitoring and um, visual monitoring is low cost and there's many field, you know, screening tools that are lower cost to incorporate into your monitoring effort. But when you, um, you know, collect samples for lab analysis, that toxin testing is the most expensive piece of your monitoring, um, besides getting, of course, people to go out and sample and, and travel. But um, 
so the toxin testing is is most expensive and and there are you know some ways to um kind of utilize your resources a little bit better um so that um you can conserve it for when um you think maybe like the populations change to then understand its toxicity so like you know monitoring by um using microscopy to look at the change um with the monitoring strategy from the technical advisory committee uh, many researchers that were part of that um, strongly supported incorporating genetic analyses into the monitoring to look at uh, the potential gene production capabilities in the dna uh, to understand what the potential toxicity of that community could be and uh, that's really a robust um, tool and uh, more and more states are incorporating that even also for um, required drinking water monitoring and so um, a lot of improvements have happened recently on using genetic analyses and it's um, part of our tiered response for um, incidents that are reported to us we uh, go from microscopy to genetic analysis and then have that inform what toxins we test for because we uh, test for um, and a panel of cyanobacteria bacteria toxins and um, that's still insufficient with all the different molecules that cyanohabs do produce so yeah it's uh, something that we can talk about further if you'd like to contact with me all right, and then if we have time, there's one last question for Jay. Are there any indications that floating bio islands reduce mercury loads in a system? Um, yeah, like that's a short answer. So I don't really know know anything about floating bio islands, um, but uh, just you know, my my initial thought would be. Um, you have to measure, you have to do an experiment and measure because as I said earlier, uh, methylmercury cycling is complicated, often surprises us, um, surprised us at many turns over the past, you know, 20 years that I've been working on it. So um, we could develop hypotheses based on what those, you know, what's, what those islands consist of, but then we would need to test it. All right. Thank you everyone um, for submitting your questions and for attending our conference today. I wanted to remind you all that we do have the business meeting at 4 p.m. today, and you can use the same link as the conference if you'd like to join that. So thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your week. Thanks for listening. Thank you everyone. Take care.